there's a, a breakout of enough impact that they get noticed. And what he does is he traces that. And it's fascinating. So if you, if you were just looking for a, a church history book to read, to find your brethren, that's one. Okay, so I'll just tell you about that. There's other, there's other stuff in the lobby. Uh, Brother Fink has his, his uh, books, some or all of them. Brother Jerry has some of O'Hare's stuff. Oh, it's on the wall over here, a bunch of things that he's reprinted from Brother O'Hare. Uh, Marvin has his uh, music tapes and so forth. Those are out in the lobby, and you need to deal with them. Don't steal them. Don't borrow them permanently. I had a fellow went was here the other day. I wasn't here. He went to my office, and he wrote me a letter back. He says, I, I, I borrowed one of your books. <laughs> he was three states away on the freeway when he wrote me that. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who it was, but his initials are Ted Fellows. <laughs> And I'm thinking, I thought I had locked my door. <laughs> anyway, it was last night, wasn't it? <laughs> I left out of there and came in here. One of, one of our ladies came. She says, I need to get in your office. I said, well, it's okay. She said, no, it's locked. <laughs> I keep my loft offices back around the back of the building over here. You, uh, you have to go around like that to get there. I keep a a cache of M&Ms on the corner of my desk with an automatic little feeder. And I do that so that the children have a motivation to come back around and see me in my office because otherwise they'd never see me. You know, you, you, Brother X here, then he's gone. Where is he? But all of the children, 11 and under here, know where the M&Ms are. They don't care anything about me. We were in a meeting in Ohio, and my wife and I were standing in the lobby of the hotel and a family from here came in with three kids, and they all looked, broke out and smiled. I thought, wow, it's great that they recognized. Went right by me like I was a, a plant. <laughs> Mrs. Jordan, Mrs. Jordan, phew. So I'm used to that. But they, they, they come to me and they look at me. They don't say, they just look and I say, it's okay. And, and they're over there. <laughs> so I bribe them. Now, you guys, see, there, there's, they, they know. Charlie and Rochelle got three little girls, and I've never been happy until one of them had blue coming out of her slobber. <laughs> yeah, their mother's not real happy about it. My, my philosophy is send them home sugared up. <laughs> send them home. <laughs> so we, we, we enjoy, you know, that. But you, you're welcome to M&M's if you'd like to go around there. And there's Dr. Pepper around there and that kind of stuff, too. But there is a, what we call a heritage room with, with stuff from memorabilia from O'Hara's ministry, radio ministry, and the old church building downtown and so forth. If you'd like to see that, you just have to work your way around past Alex's office and so forth. But it, it is worth seeing around there if you'd like to do that. All right, Second Corinthians chapter number 6 and Acts chapter number 20. Acts chapter number 20 and Second Corinthians chapter number 6. Father, we thank you today that we can have this time together and that it can be a happy time of enjoyment, but it can be a time of some instructions. And I pray that the things we're trying to communicate, I know that it can fall on fertile soil because I know as people, these, these folks get the edification process, the godly edification of grace and that form of sound words that it's out of that soil that ministry, intelligent, understanding ministry, can be produced. And my heart's desire is to point in the direction of not just having the knowledge, but having the spiritual wisdom and understanding to take that knowledge and see it work in the way you've designed it to work in the ministry and that we can do our part in Christ's name. Amen. I've said many times, and it was something that helped me years ago, when I realized that the body of Christ belongs to Him. People f worry about arguments and fussings and bust-ups and 
I was listening to a uh, tape a fellow sent me of uh, Pastor O'Hare. He's 76 years old, preaching in Grand Rapids at Burt Baker's church, Brother Floyd Baker's dad. And he was talking about being on the West Coast in Los Angeles preaching, and he said he saw in the newspaper there, and he was looking at a whole paper in the Los Angeles newspaper of r religious organizations, and he read down through about 35 different religious organizations, and he said he came back to Chicago and got to looking around and found 260 or 70, whatever the number was, of all these different... And he wrote a booklet called Isms and Sisms. And maybe some... I don't know if Jerry might have a copy of that out there. And... All the isms and schisms, all the divisions, the biting and the devouring one another. And that used to burden me about that. And one of the things that helped with that for me was to realize, you know, the body of Christ belongs to him. I, he can take care of it. I don't, I, I don't, I'm not the caretaker of the body of Christ. My responsibility is just where I'm at. So while the body of Christ belongs to him, I am responsible for where I'm at. And that's an, for me, that's an important thing in ministry. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, he says, you know my doctrine, my manner of life. The way he lived was as exemplary as the doctrine he taught. When he said, be followers of me as I am of Christ. That wasn't just follow my doctrine. It was that. But it was follow what I taught you, the things that you have seen and heard in me. Do. You didn't just hear them. You saw them put on display in my life, my actions, my attitudes. There's a passage in Acts 20 where Paul is talking to the elders of the church of Ephesus, and he describes that to them. Chapter 20, verse 17, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know, from the first day that I came into Asia... After what manner I have been with you at all seasons. You know my doctrine. You know my manner of life. What is it? Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. And with tears, many tears and temptations. Which befell me of the Jews. I'm sorry. <laughs> befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. And have showed you but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, say that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I read a passage like that and I think, Lord, if I could put something on my epitaph, that would be a great passage. Most preachers would like to, at the end, be able to say that. Paul's not at the end of his life. But most of us, if we could say it anywhere in our life, that would be it. The dimensions of the ministry. They start in verse 19. Serving the Lord. Paul understood his position. He's a servant. A verse that changed my life ministry-wise many years ago. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but we're helpers together for your joy not my job to tell you what to do. I'm not God's policeman for your life or anybody else's life. I'm to be a helper of your joy. For by faith you stand. If your Christian life isn't the response of faith to an intelligent understanding of who God's made you in Christ, it's a walk in the flesh. You'd be better going fishing than to teach your kids that. People say, oh, you really mean that? Yeah. I said, it'd be better to go fishing <laughs> than to teach your family to be religious. 
People say, yeah, but we can't pay the mortgage. Aha. Uh -huh. You ride in on our parking lot. We hear last year that parking lot didn't look like that, remember? It cost $180,000 to put that parking lot in. How would you like to do that? That's, this building is an expensive place to do ministry in. It costs about what an added staff member would cost. You know why we do that? Not because we've got a lot of money to throw around, but because we have a ministry. We have a group of people that want to have a work of ministry. And they say, if that's what it costs, it's what it takes to make it presentable, then that's what we do. So we do it. Not to have dominion over people. We don't have, my, my goal isn't to have, tell people what to do, have them do it because I tell them to do it. It's to try to teach you something that will make you decide to do it. Because then if I quit or go so, do something else, you won't quit because you weren't doing it because of me to start with. You weren't doing it because I was going to give you something. I'm terrible about that side of things. Actually on purpose. Not for that we have dominion over your faith. But we help. that helped me years ago as a young preacher to say my ministry is not to tell people, push people, make people. is to help them rejoice in Christ. And then... Be helpers of your joy. Put some structure around that that helps it fu function smoothly. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. Isn't that a wonderful expression? Ephesians 4, he says, Walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing. Colossians. Ephesians says, Walk worthy of the vocation where with your call in lowliness, in meekness, in lowliness. That's humility of mind. Not thinking about, about yourself above what you ought to think. Now, you listen to me, guys. An essential, notice that's the first thing Paul says. An essential issue that you have to come to terms with is the issue of your personal weakness. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Two verses that I often quote to myself. Second Corinthians 6, verse 9. As unknown and yet well known. <laughs> it's a fascinating thing. I don't try to meddle in anybody's business. Somebody says, you hear about so-and-so? I usually have to say, no. But don't you care? Not that I don't care. It's just I don't have my ear to the, to the ground, to the network. Why? I'm busy. How hard is that to figure out? I teach ten times a week. Every week. If I go off in a Bible conference, and I'm going to teach 12, 13, 14 times, but I teach ten times a week without doing anything. I don't have to go anywhere. You know how much study that is? How much time that is? It's work. It's called Work. <laughs> It takes my time. I live to do it. I'm not complaining. I love it. But I'm not worried about what I discover is you're well known anyway. It looks like nobody knows you. Your spiritual impact is a whole lot bigger than what you think it is. As dying, and behold, we live. We get a lot of visitors on Sunday night. On Sunday morning, this room's full, like this, more so, actually. On Sunday night, not so much. Wednesday night, a little better. We get our radio ministry, people go to church, their place Sunday morning, they come here Sunday night. Where's everybody? As dying. You guys dying out, right? Here we are. You see, people, I tell you, you've heard me say, if you got more than eight people, you got more than Noah had, and he saved the world. <laughs> I had a letter from some people in New Zealand years ago, and it, they, they sent me a, a picture of a group in, in, way down as far in New Zealand as you can get without getting on the, into the, to the Arctic down there. 
and uh, the Antarctic, and they sent me a picture, and it's a great, great group, and there's 23 of them in the back of a backyard w w having a picnic, and they sent the picture of the having a Bible class and the little church, and they were as excited as if they'd had 500,000 people in that group. And I thought, you know, isn't it, isn't it wonderful? So they have small things. You need to understand your ministry, you don't, you don't think gain is God unless you don't compare it with things that you don't compare it with. You live with a perception and understanding of what's really going on. As chastened and not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, and yet possessing all things. You know what that is? That's humility of mind. That's this humbleness of thinking. That's proper perspective of thinking. Why don't you go back? I'll give you an illustration. Go back with me to the book of Exodus. When you think of meekness, you think of Moses. The Bible says Moses was the meekest man in the earth. Now that was, that was said in, in the book of Numbers, chapter 12. But it took him a bit of time. Moses was a strong man, personally. He's, a, he's an outdoorsman. He was a shepherd. If you look at chapter 2, when he's, in, when he's in Egypt, chapter 2, verse 12 of Exodus uh, and talking about verse 11, it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens and he spied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew one of his brethren and he looked this way and that way when he saw and there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Moses was a strong guy. He was a guy who could go out in the, into the wilderness and be a shepherd. He knew how to survive. He was a strong man, and he demonstrated it by smiting the Egyptian. Then when God comes into his life, chapter 4, he says, what's in your hand? He gives him a couple of signs in verse 10. Chapter 4, verse 10, Moses said unto the Lord, O, God, o, o my Lord, I am not eloquent. Neither therefore not, nor, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, neither herefore, heretofore nor since, since thou hast spoken to thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Moses said, I got a weakness. I'm strong. I can go smite that dude, but I got a weakness. My weakness is my speech. I'm weak in speaking. Verse 11, he says, The Lord said unto him, who hath made thy, his ma man's mouth? Or who hath made the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Moses, I am God. And I, I, can, be ma I can manifest my strength in your weakness. Now you'll remember the story in Numbers 20. God brings Moses to a rock. He says, Moses, speak to the rock. Operate in your weakness and let my strength manifest itself. What did Moses do? He smote the rock. Moses' strength was in his smiting. His weakness was in his speaking. God said, operate in your weakness and I'll give you the water. Moses operated in his strength, did the smiting, and what happened? He couldn't go to the promised land because of it. You see that? Now come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. When you operate out of your strength... You're going to wind up in defeat. When you operate out of your weakness, you'll wind up in victory. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8, For this I besought the Lord thrice, that it should depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. I love that verse. He said unto me. He didn't say to Moses. He didn't say to Peter. He said, you, you got to get this. This is your message. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect, where? Not in your smiting, but your strength, but in your weakness. It's always that way. 
My strength is made perfect in your weakness. So when you seem to be unknown, when you look like you're dying, when you look like God's against you, when you look like you're poor and useless, it's okay. I learned years ago, it's okay to lose. For you to lose. The, coll the, the corollary to that is you don't have to go to every fight you get invited to. <laughs> People say, well, don't you want to defend the faith? Absolutely. Don't you want to defend yourself? If you knew about me what I knew about me, you'd know the answer to that would be, Shh, what are you talking about? Churchill said it's, to be shot at and missed is the most exhilarating experience he knew of. <laughs> the problem with that is when somebody shoots at you and they miss, if they knew what you knew, they wouldn't miss. So when you see somebody defending themselves, what have they done? They've forgotten who their self is. Now, we cover that. We say, well, I'm just defending the faith. Well, then why don't you do what the faith says? In your weakness, his strength is made perfect. Watch what Paul says. Therefore, well, keep, keep reading. Most gladly, therefore, verse 9, most gladly, therefore. That's hard. I will glory, I would, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest in me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Now, he's a bigger man than I am in that one, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. Underline that. Not because you're dumb, stupid, ill tempered. Or wrong, but it's for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then am I strong. You see, he says he put this treasure in an earthen vessel. What's the treasure? The ministry. Second Corinthians 4. We have this ministry, he says, and he put this ministry in, in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. There you are, an empty vessel with nothing of value. He puts the life of His Son, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in you. He puts eternal value in you. And you're an earthen vessel. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not you. Until you grow to the place where you aren't the issue. Where you can go and consider, take heed to thyself. Where you can get between you and God, you and your Father. When you realize that your Heavenly Father loves you so much values you so much, yearns so much for your fellowship that he was willing to pay the price of his own son to have that. And when you value that fellowship with your father as he does, you see in his son the thrilling riches that he sees in him. And you want to commune with him over all of the details of your life. And you want to talk to him about it. And you want to hear what he has to say about it. And you want to take what he has to say into consideration as to how you're going to respond. To when you get in, see, that's what prayer is. Is that commune, just, you know, we say, we're just talking to God. But, you know, I can just talk to you. But there's a difference between just talking to you and if I sit down with my wife and talk to her. Because she and I have a connection that's different.
And when you're willing to have that be more of a treasure than just being right, winning a battle, getting a paycheck, having a group of people get together and make you look good, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. There's Paul. When you get that, then you'll be ready to lead. You'll have the internal life. You'll be where I'm trying to talk to you that that the doctrine is designed to take you. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. His strength made perfect in our weakness. So that the excellency of the power of God's word. Listen, we make an issue of the Bible because the, the word of God is quick and powerful. It is the connection that you have. Jesus said, I, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit of their life. If you don't know where those words are or what they are, you're handicapped. And I don't do that because I like to be different. (laughs) I've been different all my life. I didn't need to have that. Or because I want to prove somebody else wrong. It's because there's a treasure in that that lets you come in contact. And all of a sudden, your wisdom isn't the issue. And the excellency of the power of God's Spirit working through His Word is that treasure. Serving the Lord with all humility and with many tears. Uh Uh-oh. When you serve the Lord with all humility, don't think that the answer is going to be, I got the, you know, it's going to be tears. Tears are, Talmud said that tears were agony and solution. There are going to be some moments of agony that you go through both personally and with others. And temptations, that's outside, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. You remember that du- those dudes that got together and made a pact they weren't going to eat and sleep till they killed Paul? You know, thank God for his nephew. Paul lived... In a day when the government fought him tooth and toenail. Get peace bonds against him. Throw him out of town. That's what I call. Lewd fellows of the baser sort. Go down. I mean, imagine a judge listening to lewd fellows of the baser sort. That just sounds like a bunch of criminals, doesn't it? And they thought they were better testimony than Paul and his friends. Next time you get all hyped up about what the government the government's going to do. Think about how Paul responded to that. He didn't go out and get get him a Ford card and a carry card. I got both. Don't worry about it. (laughs) He said, I just throw the Lord with all humility of mine. With tears, many tears. Understand, there's a price to be paid in ministry, and I'm willing to pay it. That's the point. I'm not the issue. I, there's a ministry, and it's what's the issue. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Here's this ministry to the saints. But showed you, and have taught you publicly, and from house to house. He's got a teaching ministry. Publicly, here we are, from house to house whether that's individual houses or the house churches, either way. Wherever he was, he's willing to teach. Why? God wants people to get saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. So with the saints, what's he doing? He's equipping them, he's teaching them, he's edifying them, bringing the godly edification so that what? They'll do what verse 21 says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He'd go out among lost people and say, hey, let's get, let's get some people saved. And he testifies to the Jews and to the Greeks. Now, 
There's this whole Acts 28 stuff that goes around about the Greeks not being Gentiles, and you know all Greeks are Gentiles, but all Gentiles aren't Greeks, and that is so. That is such. Listen, if you buy into that, somebody took about two thirds of your brain and put it to sleep. I know all Greeks are not are Gentiles, and all Gentiles aren't Greeks. But when you read Romans chapter, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, and Paul says to the Jew first and also to the Greek, who's he writing to? He's writing to Italians. Hey, dude, Italians aren't Greeks. Ask them. We got Italians and Greeks. We have Italians. See, oh, I got it. I, I, I know I've made a mistake. It's not Italians. That's, it's Italians. They get really sensitive about that. Look at them back there. Right? <laughs> And then Greeks. In fact, they're, they're, we have one family. He's Greek. And she's Italian. Woo! <laughs> you talk about Sensitiveville. You know, phew! <laughs> right over my head. I'm just glad they're saved. Because <laughs> we deal with them on the basis of being saved. They're different. And I know what people have said. That's just... Listen, it ain't great to be Acts 28. Get, get, just run away from that stuff. That... that that message from, that I was talking about, Pastor O'Hare yesterday, listening to that fascinating message, he made the comment about some Acts 28 stuff. And I never really thought about this, but he said, you know, if you're, if you're going to be at one end, one extreme of Acts or the other, Acts 2 or Acts 28, it's better to be in Acts 2 than in Acts 28. Now, you know why he would say that? Because at least then you'd have all of Paul's epistles, not just three of them. It'd be better to say the body of Christ began at Pentecost and wasn't revealed till Paul, which some people say, than to say all that Paul did prior to Acts 28 wasn't the dispensation of grace, which is what some people say. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not teaching that, but I'm not trying to get it. I just, I'm saying that to you. That's a big controversy going on around some places right now about that. That isn't what that verse is about. That verse is about talking to lost people. You know, Paul talked to lost people. He wants him to get saved. Look how he thought about himself. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit. He felt himself compelled to go to Jerusalem, not knowing the things which would befall me, save the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying, bonds and afflictions. I'm determined to go up there. I got the witness from the Spirit of God. The trouble's going to happen, going to, going to come my way. But none of these things move me, neither count on my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I don't know what the future holds. I just know one thing. I want to finish my course with joy. I want to finish the ministry that God gave me. Which is to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's what I want for you. I don't know what your future is going to hold. I know it's going to be different than what the past is. I know that you're going to have to face, especially you got, if you're under 30, you're going to have to face the challenge of retooling the form of the ministry. We were talking earlier with one of the brothers here about, uh, about uh, the, the Internet, and social media, and that kind of stuff, completely changing things. It's going to change ministry that way. The thing that holds it back is people say, well, if you do that, you can't pay the mortgage. If you do that, you can't pay the preacher. If you do that, you can't pay the missionaries. If you do, see, money gets involved. I understand those issues. And understand that there are ways in Paul's epistles where you are instructed how to deal with those things. And it's not the form we've been living with that comes out of the Industrial Revolution. But what you do is you keep your eye on the goal. Here's what it needs to look like to be a success. And what is it? It's a ministry, teaching God's Word rightly divided, producing godly edification among the believers, that causes them to be able to function together in a local church that then uses that as a base to reach out to others and repeat the process. My advice to you is to 
Keep your eyes open. Probably keep your head down too, but keep your eyes open. Your heart where it needs to be. Focus on the right things. Press the battle as fast and hard as you can. I have a saying around here, said, let's get on with the program. So, as Moody would say, press it. Don't sit where you are. Don't go home and say, well, that was nice, and put it in the shelf. Some of you need to get on the ball and get finished with your schooling. Some of you need to get out of debt. There's ministry some of you could have if you didn't have all that debt hanging on you, and you got most of that debt just out of satisfying the lust of your flesh. Oh, yeah. Some of you are in entangling alliances that you need to get out of. Some of you got a heart for the ministry. And you just consume with the passion to, to do ministry. You need to start where you are. Find people that know less than you do and preach to them. You say, I don't know much. You know how to how get saved? Yeah, well, then find some people that don't know that. I was 16 years old. I wanted, to, I wanted to preach and teach and show people what I was learning. And God told me, he said, Ricky, every time two streets cross, there's four corners. If you're on one, three of them are empty. I went down to the corner of Dauphin and Conception and Mobile and stood on the street corner and started preaching. Now, that was a sight. See a skinny little guy with a crew cut standing there wailing. Didn't, didn't have an idea what I was doing. Didn't know but about six verses. If you'd asked me about a verse, I didn't. I couldn't find one. But I, I knew Christ died for my sins. And I knew if you believed on him, he'd save you. Yeah, I just wanted to do That's what you do. Okay? You ready? My wife's going to tell you how we're going to eat. How is it going to go?